good evening everybody i'm very delighted to be here i'm also very happy to share my experience with uh, you know two important aspects of my presentation today one is uh, excavation of a neolithic site uh, at a site called saganakallu near balari and at the same time uh, setting up a museum to in order to preserve and protect uh, prehistoric heritage so most of you are familiar with historical heritage and so on but this is a very peculiar situation when it comes to prehistoric heritage because uh, this heritage is not visible uh, to you know naked eye unless you have a particular eye for identifying these features buried in subsurface situation and so on and it became essential for some of us to adopt one of the sites during the course of our career as an archaeologist and so on and the success story is a part of the presentation that i am going to make today um the title of the presentation as you can see here is uh, millet revolution 5000 years ago why emphasis on millet is this year is being declared the international year of the millets and then uh, interestingly uh, the importance of the millets were realized more than 5000 years ago by our ancestors which has been revealed through our excavations and so on but not known to many who are in the field of agriculture agricultural science and then of course health uh, you know providers and so on um, and this information about the antiquity you know how long ago you know our ancestors recognized the presence of millets in the local environment adopted them and were successful in cultivating and so on and so forth and this was possible through our excavation and it's not simply excavation which gives you an idea of what food crops were cultivated and then in this particular context it was necessary that there are sub disciplines disciplines of archaeology such as archaeobotany and archaeozoology and these two are important components of uh, human um, you know <coughs> subsistence economy and then uh, at the time uh, when these uh, you know uh, 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 millets and also basic uh, domestic animals such as cattle sheep goat chicken and so on were domesticated that was the time when this uh, neolithic you know period ushered in the history of uh, human um you know socio cultural evolution and then the uh, the the another important aspect of uh, my presentation is uh, the revolution uh, during the course of human socio cultural evolution uh, human society has crossed series of landmarks or uh, turning points and each one was a revolutionary turning point in the sense there was no looking back in terms of you know progress towards urbanization and so on around 5000 years ago the indian subcontinent witnessed uh, two distinctive revolutions one was urban revolution another was the neolithic revolution the urban revolution was characterized by the construction of huge or monumentalization of the landscape and then urban economy characterized by trade long distance trade and so on and so forth complex society etc whereas the neolithic revolution was giving rise to the emergence of uh, early agricultural economies and the first villages were also coming into existence so <clears throat> these two are contrasting but the indian subcontinent witnessed these two events taking place simultaneously in two distinct geographical uh, regions of the indian subcontinent while we have the urban revolution you know taking shape in the northwestern part of the indian subcontinent i refer to the subcontinent not the modern subdivisions like pakistan india and so on all inclusive of uh, you know the south asian countries and that is where you have you see these uh, features like uh, you know the major cities like harappa mohenjodaro dalavira lothal and so on and so forth and then the emergence of uh, you know brick architecture whereas in the context of neolithic we just see the beginning of uh, simple mud mud uh, you know mud floored the wetland daub houses and so on these were very very simple uh, and then the northwestern part of the subcontinent was characterized by rise of these uh, civilization and then the rest of the subcontinent was witnessing the gradual transformation of hunter gatherers into early agricultural societies so these provinces were there and two distinct communities and the third community which was inhabiting the interior parts of the landscape they remained hunter gatherer and pastoral and so on but whereas some of those who act, adopted the the local food local um, you know wild progenitors of domestic domesticated food crops we have a very complex variety of food crops nowadays but uh, as you go backwards in time this complexity becomes more and more simple and so on so the earlier stages were characterized by adoption of local 
you know, um, wild progenitors of all the do first domesticates that we see in the archaeobotanical record and so on. So, this uh, revolution was in a sense um, <coughs> very effective in bringing about change in the life phase of human societies. So, the basis for urban revolutions were laid by the Neolithic revolution. So, when we talk about the urban revolution in the northwestern part of the subcontinent, we see the Neolithic beginnings uh, have taken, having taken place at least, uh, you know, another 4000 years earlier than 5000 years ago. So, the beginning of Neolithic revolution in some parts of India goes back to 9000 years ago and uh, the beginning of Neolithic revolution in the rest of the Indian subcontinent takes, takes place around, you know, 4500, 5000 years ago and so on. This is the most confident, uh, you know, time frame that we have um, for the emergence of settled agricultural way of life and then the gradual evolution of a broad spectrum of food crops that, you know, plant food crops that we have uh, been, you know, cultivating and also several of these domesticated animals and that also the wide <coughs> variety of animals that are domesticated today, as you go backwards in time, we come down to one or two animal species like sheep, goat, cattle and so on and so forth. So that is where this uh, concept of revolutions in uh, human history um, has helped us understand or reconstruct the way in which socio-economic development of our you know, human society has occurred. And more particularly, we are very, very confident about our reconstructions um, during the last 5000 years or so. So, these simple huts uh, still survive in different parts of southern India, especially in the heartland of the peninsula of South India. You go back into the interior landscape, you still see survival of uh, these simple huts that I have been showing on the right hand side of this particular side and so on. So, Neolithic traits have continued to survive, but yet there is a complex uh, you know, <coughs> character uh, to the urban uh, societies that we have. So, the emphasis on millets is because um, the earliest uh, food crops that were cultivated um, in, the, in India happened to be millets. And this was not known until these sites like Sanganakalu were excavated, until the discipline of uh, archaeobotany and uh, its laboratory techniques were employed uh, in identifying the food crops that, uh, you know, the seeds that were recovered from archaeological deposits and so on. Why we had to look back and then see um, <coughs> uh, you know, what is in store for us in these Neolithic sites is because for a very, very long time, it was thought that, you know, agriculture in southern Indian, you know, began much later than in other parts of northwestern part of Indian subcontinent and so on. We wanted to test this hypothesis until the food crops from Indus Valley Civilization province were introduced into southern uh, part of the Indian peninsula. There was no agriculture. It was purely pastoral way of life and so on. It was an unbelievable kind of an hypothesis and uh, not based on a scientific data sets and so on. So, it became necessary for us to go back because uh, hundreds of sites have been known uh, which have been identified as Neolithic sites in different parts of peninsular South India and none of them had uh, provided evidence about the type of the earliest food crops that were cultivated. And so, it was signed off as a situation where you know, there was no scope for agriculture, uh, plant agriculture, because the environment was not favorable, because the, the, the much of the landscapes or fallow lands not suitable for agriculture and so on and so forth. And then the monsoon regimes were also very, very weak, not facilitating cultivation of food crops and so on. But this was uh, <coughs> to be tested uh, because large number of sites were subject to excavation by several archaeologists during the last 160 years or so. So, it was necessary in the post-1970 uh, time period, many of these sub-disciplines were cropping up in the field of archaeology, especially in prehistoric archaeology and that is where it became necessary for us to revisit some of those well, uh, you know, <coughs> excavated sites and then see the scope for our potential for recovering, uh, you know, food crops in the form of charred grains of seeds and, you know, uh, <coughs> parenchyma tissue and so on and so forth. So, that is where the 1990s, uh, you know, opened up, uh, you know, scope for reinvestigation and as a result of a series of investigations at a number of sites, we were able to reconstruct the agricultural economy. The emphasis on millets is because the excavations and then archaeobotanical analysis that we carried out gave us clues to the fact 
that there were some basic millets and also pulses which were ubiquitous across the entire indian peninsula outside the the province covered by the indus valley civilization and so on the indus valley civilization food package was much more uh, you know <coughs> diversified they had cereals varieties of cereals and also you know millets coming from northwestern and central asian regions and so on but this uh, you know the remote peninsula or south india was you know insulated from any such influence immediate influence from the the province uh, covered by the indus valley civilization so it was necessary that we go back to this so look at this particular table we have at least 18 uh, varieties of millets which are native to different provinces across the world and some of those where we see this triangular you know uh, <coughs> symbol here they are the ones which are native to the indian subcontinent but they were not identified in the archaeological record so some of these like uh, brown top millet which is known as koralu uh, in kannada and telugu and so on um uh, sipadda samar is one which is very native to south india has now been you know uh, identified in the archaeological deposits and then we have sava millet um, some of these millets were not right from the beginning but then uh, during the course of last 5000 years many of these local millets were gradually incorporated into the agricultural economy of the neolithic and post neolithic you know cultural um, <laughs> phases and so on and then we do have this uh, proso millet um, and then uh, uh, we have little millet uh, and then we have kodo millet pearl millet fox tail millet and then yellow fox tail millet and then you have uh, uh, prisley fox tail um these fox tail millets are very very common they are widespread between china central asia and also peninsular india some of the pulses like horse gram green gram black gram are native to different uh, you know ecosystems across the indian peninsula uh, and some of these millets were also introduced from outside so the, the introduction took place much later in time and and prior to that these local millets were identified by these early agro pastoral communities and were successfully adopted as uh, you know basic food crops of uh, the neolithic agricultural economy and so on so millet basis uh, laid the basis for the emergence of agricultural way of life across the major part of peninsular india in, except the region west of the aravallis towards baluchistan plateau and then westwards into southwest asians there is an entirely different cultural province that we see um and the tempo of changes were much more rapid or faster in that particular area as compared to this uh, major part of the indian peninsula the extra peninsula and the peninsula and so on so <coughs> um the millets uh, you know have a lot of uh, advantages uh, for agricultural economy um you know in you know in terms of they are um termed as uh, miracle grains um, or crops of the future um by uh, modern day agronomists and they can not only grow under harsh circumstances because you know um, even drier hotter soil uh, temperature conditions can also facilitate germination of these millet seeds and so on but if you introduce cereals like uh, wheat and barley or rice um, unless you have irrigated uh, fields you will not be able to cultivate uh, you know cereal crops like rice wheat barley and so on so that is where millets become very very important in the agricultural economy and then uh, as i said they don't pollute the environment say like wheat and you know rice and so on uh, they can cause uh, you know release of methane gas and uh, several other pollutants into the atmosphere and cause uh, you know uh, ecological imbalance and millets contribute to mitigating climate change whenever you have drought years um it is always uh, you know easy to switch over to millet agriculture rather than um <coughs> cereal agriculture and so on many of the millets are also included in the cereal crop cereal group uh, but then some of these millet millets um are peculiar in terms of their morphology and so on and there is broad classification of millets into large millets and small millets and then small millet categories were the first ones to be domesticated in southern india and then the larger millets like uh, jowar and ragi they were introduced into india from africa so there are these millets which are native to india and millets which were introduced into india from outside and so on and then the most popular ones like uh, finger millet and uh, sorghum uh, millet uh, they have come from africa including bazra 
uh, that we have today very very stable food crop uh, in modern times as well so looking at uh, this archaeological record uh, it is now possible to trace the manner in which uh, agricultural economy gradually developed and then um, the agricultural productivity which was based on monsoon uh, you know seasonality uh, was gradually um, <coughs> changing into uh, what we call um, intensive agriculture that is introducing agricultural change which was possible uh, through small small scale irrigation uh, what we call gravity irrigation and uh, facilitating cultivation of winter crops so wheat and barley get introduced into india so the intensive agriculture gradually gives rise to surplus food production and then other areas of your human economy also you know diversifies and that is what we have seen in the archaeological record so i would like to um, give you uh, a picture of how these inferences that i was referring to have been uh, <clears throat> obtained through investigations at uh, a number of archaeological sites but for this purpose i selected the site of sanganakallu for various reasons as we will know gradually and this site uh, uh, has been known to us for very very long time it was first discovered um, in the 1980s the site neolithic site of sanganakallu but prior to the di- discovery of sanganakallu neolithic site uh, you know we see two broad categories of neolithic settlements uh, in different parts of southern india uh, one category is represented by what we call ash mounds another category is the village settlements so sometimes these ash mounds are part and parcel of a village settlement and sometimes they are found isolated away from the village settlements and so on so this dichotomy is still uh, seen very clearly uh, in the archaeological landscape across peninsula or south india and first of these ash mounds because the ash mounds were you know <coughs> identified as part and parcel of neolithic way of life and then they were identified as uh, heaps of cattle dung which were deliberately accumulated and then set on fire uh this uh, this particular aspect of formation of an ash mound was very clearly defined by uh, robert brucefoot uh, the picture you see here and he was the first person to integrate the ash mound and the village settlements located on tops of granitic hills as one and the same and then prior to that uh, the first of these archaeological sites were discovered way back in 1802 uh, by colin mackenzie the well known surveyor general of uh, the first surveyor general of india uh, is responsible for documenting variety of historical source materials in addition to that he was also uh, keenly observing landscape features and then identifying distinctiveness uh, you know across the landscapes and that is where some of the mounds uh, that, that is shown here was first discovered way back in 1802 but they were not sure what it is and that was the time of pre identification day 1802 to 1830s 1840s uh, was the time period when um, not much was known about this particular mounds as archaeological mounds so they were thought to be a product of natural processes and so on but anyway so the coming of food uh, transformed our understanding of what these mounds are and what are their cultural you know affiliations as such Excuse so me. yeah what do we mean of volcanic scoria um you know the volcanic scoria is a very um uh, what we call honeycomb like calcrete like material in physical appearance so scoria uh, is a thing which is product of high temperature uh, lava you know coming out and then giving rise to formation of uh, this concrete uh, material so it was um, they thought that initially uh, when it was first subject to laboratory analysis they said that it is a material of volcanic origin because of uh, the physical characteristics uh, visible to this paper analysis was not very clear about whether it was burnt cow dung or not until robert brucefoot confirmed it uh, in the later part of the 19th century so this is a deliberately accumulated uh, cattle dung associated with agro pastoral communities um going back to 5000 years or so so they are widespread across different parts of northern part of karnataka western part of andhra pradesh and so on and there is a time period when these ash mounds continue to be part and parcel of the neolithic way of life so these ash mounds this is the largest and the first ever ash mound which was identified 
uh, by these uh, early explorers and then the first ever ash mound to be identified as part of the Neolithic. And since then, many such ash mounds came to be identified across different sectors of northern part of Karnataka and western. Nearly 300 such ash mounds were identified and very few of them only survive. Fortunately for us, this ash mound will survive forever because it is being uh, protected through uh, <coughs> resources obtained from uh, CSR programs of local industrialists and so on and so forth. And uh, the site of Sanganakalu is another archaeological site which is also being uh, developed into an heritage site um, of that time period and so on. So most of these Neolithic sites are associated with this kind of landscape that you see here. Uh, they are all hilltop sites. Most of the earliest settlements were located on the hilltops surrounded by flat terrain very flat erosional plains uh, with poor drainage uh, network. There are hardly any river flowing by these earlier settlements. Normally, we, we associate these settle early settlements with the banks of the rivers and so on. But you look at this particular landscape, we rarely come across a perennial river flowing in this region and also a region which receives very, very low rainfall. But 20, 20 inches is the highest amount of rainfall during the course of uh, summer monsoon in this area. And naturally, this area is a regional plain because the uh, lack of channeled uh, you know, water courses um, as a result of sheet washes. The, uh, the precipitation taking place in this particular landscape used to flow from top of these hills and along the slopes of the hill, gently flowing down and then you know, uh, accumulating at the base of the hills and so on. So there is no scope for channelized water courses in this area. Yet, we see very high density of these settlements associated this, with this kind of landscape and most of them were located on tombs of uh, granitic hills. And that was another big question we were to address. Why these settlements were set, you know, located on tops of the hills when there are no rivers, you know, perennial rivers, small or large, and even water holes in the neighborhood as we see today. But then for us to re reconstruct the, you know, paleo geography, uh, it was a bit of uh, you know interdisciplinary effort, and then we had to find a convincing answer why these uh, village settlements were first located on tops of uh, granitic hills and so on. So this is that one such large settlement, which was discovered by one William Fraser, a civil engineer who was based in uh, Bellary in the, <coughs> in the middle of uh, 19th century, and when Robert Bruce Foote came to Bellary region to generate you know, resource maps of minerals and metals and, you know, uh, <clears throat> various types of rocks and so on. He was introduced because by then he was already familiar with the distinctive nature of different archaeological sites of the Neolithic, Paleolithic and also Iron Age and so on. So William Fraser introduced him to this particular site and he was quick in, in identifying the nature of the site as one of the largest stone axe manufacturing sites. So the Neolithic period was characterized by the production of what we call uh, polished stone axes or ground stone axes or simply cells and so on, as opposed to Paleolithic, you know, uh, <coughs> flaked stone implements. Uh, but here, this this uh, site was identified as a major factory by Robert Bruce Foote himself, and then he was began to document the presence of various other, you know, <coughs> cultural features in this area, and then he tried to identify the source of raw materials from which varieties of uh, you know antiquities were made varieties of uh, you know ar antiquity artifacts were made and that is where in the in the report that he published um, which is uh, called memoir of the geological survey um, of bellary district uh, he had a separate chapter on economic geology in the sense the procurement of r basic raw materials and uh, you know from distant, uh, you know, outcrops, you know, distant geological belts, and then modifying them into various types of artifacts and so on. So that particular chapter laid the basis of uh, inquiry into the provenance of various types of raw materials which were utilized by these Neolithic folk and so on. At that point of time, it was certainly, you know, because of the type of stone tools which were abundant and densely scattered on the surface, uh, <coughs> it was easy to identify that site as a Neolithic site because that celt was typical of Neolithic period. But anyway, later uh, we had to revise uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, characterization of the site, whether it was Neolithic or early Neolithic, middle Neolithic, late Neolithic, or even Iron Age and so on. 
So the kind of uh, you know stone ar axes uh, were made from locally occurring um, dolerite or gabbro, what we call, uh, which is uh, an intrusive rock into the granite, granite, and that was the major source of raw material for making these uh, polished or ground stone axes and so on. And then the summit of the hill also reveals the landscape uh, characterized by these imageries. You know, the 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 landscape <coughs> is full of such uh, you know. Uh, bull imageries and bull occupied a, a special place amongst these uh, Neolithic settlers of the hill. And then um, this is the kind of uh, hill uh, on top of which the earliest uh, stone axe manufacturing activity took place. So why these um, you know settlements were on top of these granitic hills is because the granite is a, a domal feature there. We call it an inselberg. And then uh, the intrusion, you know, it's again a subterranean volcanic activity which intruded into the granitic body. And that is the typical dolerite or gabbro that we call. It is um, uh, the, <coughs> the one is crystalline rock and it is very, very fine grained rock. So dolerite was the most popular raw material which was utilized for making these polished stone axes. And the granite was the rock which is abundant in this region was used for making various other artifacts such as corn crushers, you know, uh, rub rubbing stones, grinding stones, uh, chisels and so on and so forth. So these uh, different rocks were there. In addition to that, exotic raw materials were brought to the site to produce uh, objects of ornament. Various types of beads were made from uh, precious and semi-precious stones, including um, procurement of metal, precious metal like gold and also copper, which is abundant in the neighborhood of uh, you know, these sites because the geological complex uh, formations are very, very complex. There are two distinctive geological formations. Both are Precambrian in age. One is greenstone belt, another is the granitic. Granitic hills were the ones where, were the places where the Neolithic occupation took place and the greenstone belts were the areas where they procured uh, you know varieties of metals like copper gold and so on and in addition to that cryptocrystalline silica minerals the jasper agate and uh, steatite and so on and so forth which are used for making beads and so on so they are procured from uh, these uh, geological outcrops in that area so this uh, site of Sanganakalu um, has been known to us, as I said, since 1870s, uh, has been subject to periodic visits by various types of archaeologists as well as those civil servants, they, you know, who made their own observations about various aspects of cultural um, you know, features that were visible to these people, whether it is rock art, whether it is the stone axes, whether these, the, the surface uh, scatter of various types of beads and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, <clears throat> uh, this is a complex of five hills near the village of Sanganakal today. And uh, one of the hills was uh, subject to excavation in the 1940s. After Foot's work, uh, there was a gap of nearly 60, 70 years. And then uh, one of uh, our senior archaeologists by name, Subarao, who was uh, <coughs> trained by Sir Mortimer Wheeler at a site called Brahmagiri, a well-known place where we have the Ashokan edicts. Uh, he was introduced to this Bellary region to retrace the footsteps of Robert Bruce Foot because he had discovered nearly 200 uh, Neolithic, Megalithic and then you know other category Paleolithic sites in the Rayalaseema region. So it was easy for many uh, archaeologists of post-independence period to retrace his footsteps and then come out with you know uh, <coughs> a, a, a scientific account of uh, the archaeology of subsectors, various sectors of the Royal Seam and so on. So that is where Subarao happened to select the region of Bellary and then added many more sites. In addition to that, he excavated on top of this hill. And then some of these legions that you see here are the ones which... Uh, um, so we, uh, if you can look at it uh, carefully, you have these areas identified by the most recent investigations that we carried there. And the earliest excavations were carried at the, the, the westernmost hill here. And the, the easternmost hill is the largest one, which is known as Peacock Hill, Large Hill, Hiregoda, and so on. That is where uh, the stone axe factory was identified by Robert Brucefoot. And then in addition to that, at the base of these hills, we have these rock shelters. Um, and the surface on the outer surface of these boulders, we do have uh, you know paintings of that time period. And around this particular rock shelter, we have an activity uh, where 
small microliths were produced by utilizing uh, the scatter of quartz shingles uh, on the pediment surface you know all around this flat surface you the huge scatter of um, you know quartz pebbles from which these microliths were made so stone axes were the ones which were heavy duty tools and these microliths were the one which were produced in order to generate composite tools which facilitated in harvesting grasses and so on and so forth so this is the um, the the hill top which was excavated by uh, b subaro and as you can see here this is surrounded by vast erosional plain and then in the far end you have this uh, greenstone belt which is this area um, which provided uh, adequate resources of uh, crypto crystalline silica rocks sometimes copper uh, you know mines have also been located dating back to the neolithic times and then occasionally greenstone belts also um, <coughs> have given uh, evidence for uh, you know the procurement of precious metal like gold and so on and so forth so this particular landscape you know you don't come across a single river and post neolithic times you you will see very sh shallow you know drainage uh, channels but they're not running into several kilometers just terminating after several for 10 to 15 kilometers or so and that kind of landscape so when uh, we wanted to reconstruct because material culture was uh, uh, fully described but then the subsistence economy was not very clear to us until uh, we began reinvestigation in the 1990s till then we were only thinking this neolithic uh, economy was primarily based on cattle pastoralism so, on. so they were called neolithic you know cattle pastoral <coughs> communities uh, inhabiting this particular area because of low rainfall regimes and being a rain shadow area there was little scope for producing uh, plant uh, you know foods and so on but then when uh, we went back uh, to these sites and reopened some of those previously excavated uh, uh, you know uh, trenches we were in for a big surprise not only we were able to recover varieties of okay um, varieties of um, you know um, <coughs> organic remains uh, but also we discovered the presence of buried ash mounds we saw a ash mound located far away from a neolithic village but here on top of the hill we saw the base itself there was an ash mound and so on so this also became very clear to us to identify uh, the the geographical uh, <coughs> dichotomy in terms of you know isolated ash mounds and in terms of ash mounds which are part and parcel of uh, a neolithic village but what we were able to draw inference is that prior to the establishment of the village the ash mound formation took place and then over a period of time when the village settlement became a permanent uh, you know uh, uh, place uh, the the ash mound got buried and then it is uh, you know overlain by the what we call habitation soil soil resulting from human occupation and this is the this is the horizon which yields as a, you know microscopic remains and that is where it, it was necessary uh, that we go back and then collect samples for laboratory analysis and identify microscopic remains including uh, you know evidence for um, <coughs> uh, aquatic fauna and also charred grains um, of various food crops that were cultivated by these and then as you can see we don't see brick brick architecture this is all mud floored uh, wetland top structures and what we see is the four post holes that we see uh, they are all circular and plan like i showed in the very first slide and then part of the area which was excavated revealed the presence of post holes and then right on the bedrock um, you have uh, the floor of the house and then the wetland top structure was erected and so on and so the cluster of houses they came up on top of this particular ash mound here and these soils were very very potential revealing um, the evidence of various types of uh, food crops and then animal remains and so on it was part of the ritual activity associated with fertility um, and so that is why there are so many theories but in one you know final inference that we have now over the last 5 6 decades of uh, debate amongst ourselves so they were part of a ritual activity associated with early farming community and so on and they were uh, that was the time when cattle was not consumed as a, you know part of the human diet so it was a defied animal especially the you know the bull imageries that you see here and so uh, after about 1900 bc we see that uh, you know cow dung becomes uh, part of uh, agricultural 
manure you know manuring activity and so this it ceases the mound formation ceases and so on but then we have these ash mounds um, formation taking place from about 2700 bc to almost up to 1200 bc so at different sites at different points of time um, when the villages were coming up they were first uh, associated with the formation of an ash mound and then the village settlement coming up in those areas so that is the kind of relationship that we have been able to see and all the year there are so many theories we don't want to dismiss them but one thing i can clearly say this uh, fire played an important role in ritual activities performance of rituals uh, cattle ritual was very very common amongst these early agricultural communities so another view of uh, the excavated area and uh, these excavations as i said were aimed at recovering uh, evidence for agricultural activity and so on so on top of the hill as i mentioned you have this particular rock uh, uh, called dolerite which was the source of raw material for making stone axes polished stone axes and then uh, the debitage these are you know lakhs of pieces of you know flakes uh, resulting from manufacturing of stone polished stone axes and so on so you can see more than a meter thick waste flakes lying on top of an ash mound here again and then some of these blocks of granite they are portable ones they were associated with some of these circular features so these circular features uh, were the places where you have individual workshops on top of the hill plateau you have series of such circular features uh, with an avenue on either side and uh, i'm just showing one of the circulars which was excavated and to establish the fact that this was also a residence come uh, lithic workshop associated with one uh, you know um, <coughs> family so we have evidence of uh, activity um, <coughs> uh, resulting uh, in the formation of this kind of deposit and then the finished artifacts were you know uh, traded across that is the time but this 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 neolithic uh, stone axe manufacturing activity was not right at the beginning of this settlement here uh, it occurs uh, you know towards the end of the neolithic period so that is why i said although it is called neolithic um, but the basic uh, site development occurred towards the end of the neolithic and the beginning of what we call pre iron iron age and so on so those that particular circular feature was excavated and the result is this that all that deposit that we have nearly 40 lakh pieces of waste products as well as number of finished hand axes i mean stone polished stone axes and observe this particular block of stone with such deep grooves the intensity of axe grinding and polishing you know taking place in this particular uh, circular feature so southwestern part of this particular uh, uh, circular feature was residential area we have uh, a hearth there and several other domestic uh, features um, and then the charcoal remains were the ones which were you know very very helpful in establishing the age or the time um, when this particular workshop was active so it goes back to about 1300 bc or so whereas neolithic in this area goes back to 3000 years so that 5000 years of uh, you know um, neolithic way um, 5000 years ago uh, the neolithic way, way of life began in this area is reflected here but this particular evidence clearly tells us that intensity of stone axe manufacturing activity was much later in time when surplus was being generated so surplus you know winter cultivation was also uh, initiated so surplus in terms of uh, producing various types of other you know antiquities which i will gradually show you so this is one such example where we have a stone axe factory um, and uh, <coughs> the stages of making so the procurement of uh, the dolerite blocks and then uh, the stages in the way in which the block was subject to uh, chipping stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 5 6 the finally you have a polished axe and that waste products are living here as a result of uh, the intensity of uh, work um, <coughs> workmanship you see the debitage accumulating here you can imagine there are series of such uh, you know circular features each one was a workshop com residence dating back to about 1300 bc or so and then the bedrocks uh, bedrock granite was uh, the one which was utilized very effectively for grinding the edges of the axes so you have the grooves here and then the um, bedrock mortars we come across some of those um, you know unfinished ones were discarded 
whereas the finished uh, uh, axes were you know traded across over a large area and that is the intensity of manufacturing activity uh, and the surplus generation also indicates the expansion of trading network associated with uh, you know this particular commodity produced by the community who were living here so the polishing of the surface of the axe was taking place on the granitic bedrock and you see the you know the surface uh, feature here um, you know uh, initial um, <coughs> polishing and if the same spot is subject to continuous uh, you know polishing of the surface it becomes deeper and deeper and finally it goes even deeper and then the grooves the edges were grooved axe edges were sharpened here the body of the axe was polished here so these are the features that we come across across the entire landscape in this region um so <coughs> why the settlement was located on top of a hill uh, the the fact that there there, there is no water drainage ne ne network anywhere anywhere in this area how could these people survive so as i mentioned granite and then the dolerite intrusion causes um, you know obstruction of the flow of groundwater unlike the surface water which flows from higher level to lower level the groundwater flows from lower level to higher level as you go backwards in time water tables were higher and higher even 50 years ago what there were large number of springs in this area so the obstruction of a flow of groundwater uh, through by the intrusion of the dikes was the one which gave rise to formation of springs along the sides of these hills along the sides of this is now we don't see them water table has gone down by several hundred feet so uh, for us it was necessary to explain why the sites were located on top so when we looked at the geomorphic features and then the geological uh, context in which uh, various uh, you know uh, chemical precipitates like what we call spring tufa uh, uh, occurring in the crevices and fractures uh, you know in the areas where we have uh, the, the granite granite and uh, dolerite intrusion having occurred we found uh, spring tufa so spring spring tufa formation takes place when water tables uh, re recede and then uh, you know <coughs> uh, the springs also dry up so we could also see black soil patches here this is all granitic landscape and there are series of black soil patches now it is all a modified landscape in the last 2000 years or more uh, but then what we saw was the black soil patches are not in situ development of uh, you know black soil they were associated with pools and ponds ponded soils so that demarcation of black soils in the at the base of these hills was another added evidence for us to argue for the presence of gentle flow of springs discharge accumulating in the you know in the in the floor of the uh, in the at the base of the hills so there were these swamps and so on and water holes and then the perennial spring activity supporting uh, the settlers um, on tops of these hills and then most of these animal domestication and small scale agriculture was carried out um, along the uh, the banks of these water holes and swampy areas and so on so a clear example of the buried ash mound here and then uh, we have the habitation soil associated with the village settlement uh, emerging uh, at a particular point of time when the whole uh, plateau surface was occupied by the the settlers of uh, <coughs> these hills early agro pastoral communities and radiocarbon dating uh, was one thing which helped us in identifying the stages of development of the settlement so we have an ash mound phase here uh, prior to the emergence of the village here and then post village formation what we see during the course of the time period from about 1900 bc to 1500 bc you have uh, the village uh, you know expansion taking place on tops of the uh, you know hill plateau and then from about 1300 bc what we see the emergence of uh, uh, <coughs> wheel made pottery Uh, emergence of megalithic burial complexes and then uh, the the intensity of more stone axe manufacturing activity taking place so the radiocarbon chronology for the history of the settlement at sanganakallu dates from about 2200 bc and then uh, survives up to about 1250 bc post 1250 bc we have the settlement shifting from uh, hill complex to the plains and so on and then gradually the emergence of uh, iron age Uh, in this particular area so this same story is repeated at other uh, hill tops and uh, the chronology of the settlement is uh, similar to what we see uh, on other hills we see the hills 
So the uh, ashbound phase, then you have the village and then the axe workshop dating from about 1400 to 1250 BC. So uh, the oldest ash mound that we know in the region dates back to about 2700 BC. The youngest ash mound that we know uh, as of today at Sanganakallu dates back to about you know, 1300 BC or so. So that is a long time span. So initially uh, archaeologists thought that ash mound phase was the earliest phase of the Neolithic era. But then our investigations have given us this particular uh, you know, inference uh, that ash mounds did, did not see com, uh, cease to uh, come into existence at a particular point of time. They survived for over nearly 1200 to 1400 year time period at different sites, um, at different settlements, different, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, at different points of time, these settlements were associated with ash mound and so on. But after 1900 BC, when the settlement expansion took place towards eastern part of the peninsula, uh, the, the ash mounds disappear altogether. So there are these geographical variation in the way in which um, this particular uh, Neolithic of ash mound tradition and Neolithic of non-ash mound tradition. So this non-ash mound tradition uh, goes back to earlier than 2700 BC. Then ash mound tradition begins around 2700 BC, survives up to 1200 BC. And then post ash mound, you have the emergence of early Iron Age, uh, where we don't have clear evidence of, uh, you know, production of iron artifacts, but then intensive activity resulting in the production of uh, large scale production of stone axes, wheel made pottery, black and red ware, and then expansion of trade metamorphs, gradually giving rise to the formation of an urban economy we were during the next uh, 600 to 800 years or so. By the time the modern expansion takes place in this area, uh, these were full-fledged Iron Age uh, communities in this region uh, with the intensive agriculture and then, uh, you know, pyrotechnology playing very important role in the production of multiple varieties of uh, uh, <coughs> material goods and so on. And then uh, the archaeobotanical inference that we were able to draw from uh, uh, this particular sequence of sediments, uh, ash mound sediment, ash mound, uh, non ash mound, and then post ash mound, uh, gives us um, a clear picture of the earliest food crops that were cultivated by these people. So what we know is, um, is staple food crops, so two pulses and two millets, and they are all native to this area. So we have this uh, um, native South Indian suit is Cetaria briskly foxtail millet. Uh, this foxtail, there are multiple varieties of foxtail, some native to peninsular India, some coming from China even. So foxtail millets are this Navane variety. And then we have the brown, brown top, uh, you know, millet. <coughs> and then macrotylema is horse gram. And then uh, mung bean is the green gram. So these are the uh, two pulses and two uh, millets that are recurrent across uh, a network of sites uh, between the Eastern and Western Ghats. And these uh, pulses are found um, you know, progenitors of many of these pulses are found in the Ghats, Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, and then Central Indian uh, Plateau and so on, which were gradually incorporated. But the earliest pulses and earliest mills, millets that we come across uh, as early as uh, 3000 BC happened to be these two, uh, two pulses and two millets. And then by about 1900 BC, we have this gravity flow uh, irrigation, terracing of the surfaces along the slopes of these hills. And then, uh, you know, <coughs> spring water was harnessed for introducing uh, winter crops, which were introduced from northwestern part of Indian sub subcontinent via northern Deccan. Because north of the Krishna Basin, we have the western Deccan region where we have a series of sites where uh, as early as 2000 BC, um, food crops which were already familiar to Indus Valley people were introduced into northern part of uh, peninsular India. By about 2000-1900 BC, uh, we have wheat, barley um, cultivation taking place in the Neolithic of southern India as well. And then uh, <clears throat> by about 1500 BC, we have African crops, uh, gradually uh, hyacinth, breen, and then we have uh, pearl, pearl millet or what we call sajay. And then pigeon pre coming from central India, Bastar region, the famous Thor dal, uh, they were introduced because this uh, once uh, the irrigation, small scale irrigation was developed by these uh, settlers, um, you know, introduction of winter crops was also possible. So the agri agricultural surplus also get generated. 
so that is what we see by 1500 bc onwards large scale production the settlements become more and more permanent and very intensive activity in terms of producing stone axes in terms of producing uh, you know wheel made black and red ware and then in terms of introducing food crops exotic food crops into southern india and so on and then the chicken also was introduced around this time and it is of north indian origin and then further eastwards in china and so on so the wild progenitors of some of these pulses and millets are shown in these maps so the moist deciduous forest ecosystems we are are uh, they rich in varieties of these pulses and then you have these millets uh, widespread across uh, you know different parts of peninsular india and so on um, <clears throat> so the package remains uh, very well established so this is the kind of agricultural uh, package that we see in the neolithic context um, post 1300 bc onwards it becomes much more widespread we have fiber crops getting introduced pyrotechnology becomes a very common thing amongst these uh, communities and they gradually s shift from uh, hill top areas towards uh, you know the region which is drained by a network of streams and so on so that is one reason why we took up um, you know excavations at sanganakallu but yet another reason why we worked at uh, Uh, in this area was when we first uh, uh, arrived at uh, this site at Sanganakallu in 1990s we saw the fate of the site you know uh, threatened by large scale mining activity and so on and this is as i said with the potential site the perhaps the largest site anywhere in south india a lot of uh, you know information is buried in the landscape here but nobody knows or nobody is aware of it and then we landed here this was the situation so we had to take steps to make sure that further damage to this particular site does not take place and it is you know adopt to this site in order to make sure that prehistoric landscapes not across the entire region but some of these sites which are very very potential and hold a lot of material you know <coughs> you know evidence buried in the landscape needs to be preserved for generations to come because the new methodologies always help us to probe deeper into the you know cultural systems that were operating in this area and so on so uh, even the ash mounds you know because of quarrying activity they were getting destroyed uh, these ash mounds as we saw they were some of them were buried and some of them were on the shoulders of these hills and they were because of quarrying activity they were also um, you know <coughs> suffering total destruction and then this is the kind of uh, material scoriaceous material which was initially observed by the early um, you know scholars who analyzed the material they they thought that it is the volcanic in origin for that matter it looks like calcareous deposit but otherwise it is burnt and then the landscape also preserves evidence for habitation evidence for rock art activity uh, dating back to last 5000 years or so and then the bedrock features where the stone axes were manufactured uh, where the grains were processed these are bedrock mortars concave hollows that we see uh, across the entire landscape and even on top of the hill we have this kind of megaliths you know of the later period iron age period and so on so all of them were disappearing from the landscape so and there nobody has studied them and uh, they have hold lot of potential for further research so needs to be protected and the landscape is you know <coughs> dominated by these imageries so this uh, particular bull occupies a special place in the culture of these neolithic and iron age people and such imageries were produced on the rock surfaces across the entire landscape if you go on top of the hill then the summit of the hill you have uh, you know hundreds of these in fact we have documented 2000 elements of rock art on the one on one particular hill in this area so if the hill is subject to granitic quarrying you know continues all this would have been lost we still did not have you know we have not been able to understand uh, or articulate these cultural features into a system culture system because they have been studied independent of one another so art rock art specialists come and look at the imageries from their perspective archaeologists come and excavate and then they document the evidence for human you know <coughs> productive activities taking place in that area but there is some relationship between all activities that were taking place simultaneously in this particular landscape that needs to be understood so initial documentation has taken place and they have been independently you know described and then there are certain inferences but they need to be interrelated to all activities that were taking place and for that we need uh, these uh, such sites to be protected forever and ever um these were not they, there was no need for you know 
<coughs> hunting activity because they were domesticating sheep, goat, cattle and so on. And occasionally they were hunters. And this particular landscape supported uh, cattle pastoralism, sheep, goat pastoralism on a very, very large scale. And there was no dearth of uh, animal uh, food for these communities in addition to the cultivated crops. There are some scenes, uh, but very rare, uh, you know, emphasis. We have not come across evidence for animals which were hunted by these people. Most of the uh, animal bones that have been recovered from archaeological deposits, they dominantly represented by sheep and goat remains and less of cattle. The cattle was not consumed by these people. This was, this was a defied animal. And so we see this, that distinction, you know, uh, seen in the archaeozoological record. And then such, uh, you know, varieties of, uh, you know, exotic raw materials which were procured and then uh, objects of ornaments, lapidaries existing in this area, they are very much part of this landscape. Not easily visible to naked eye, but one can see and archaeologists will be able to identify these features, as I said, copper, gold and so on. And then the type of axes that were produced were much sought after. Perhaps there is a long distance trade network prevailing uh, during the towards the end of the second millennium BC, so 13, 1400 BC onwards, and then gradually replaced by the you know, production of iron objects and so on. And then wheel made black and red ware um, appears, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> during this time period, we call it Iron Age black and red ware. Uh, this has been found at a number of sites in the Iron Age context itself. So the settlement flourished as a major, uh, you know, <clears throat> one point, sorry, well, uh, thousand acre area uh, by the end of the first millennium, sorry, by the end of the second millennium, so 1200 BC, post 1200 BC to till the emergence of uh, Ashoka, uh, Mauryan phase in this area, we see these settlements uh, uh, flourishing in this region, um, uh, reflected by the presence of such. So during the course of uh, our investigations, uh, not only at Sanganakalu, uh, but at a number of these related sites, and also uh, during the course of my own investigations in this particular region over a period of 40 years, large number of antiquities were collected. And if they were not systematically documented, catalogued and then made available for researchers, it is again a great loss, you know, in terms of uh, heritage uh, of, of, of our past. So that is where to protect the site and also make sure that the antiquities are available for further study, uh, we had to make effort to make sure uh, that we set up a museum here and uh, we were fortunate enough to get support from the district administration and over a period of 10 years from about 2002 to 2009 we succeeded uh, in procuring a building and also uh, obtaining resources to set up uh, you know a storage uh, systematic storage and organize uh, cataloging because they were to be transferred from some of these you know trunks and sacks and so on into uh, boxes and then organize them uh, systematically, <coughs> computerize this data, and then invite scholars who are interested in taking up detailed study, not only physically preserve them, but also preserve them in a digital form as well. So we have our Japanese collaborators who are helping us to digitize each and every aspect. Now today a museum houses nearly 40 lakh pieces of antiquities uh, belonging to Paleolithic period, Mesolithic period, and, and of course Neolithic Iron Age and megalithic time periods and so on. So this is another success uh, story. And um, we were not sure whether mining act activity can be you know, uh, stopped. So we thought we should first uh, create a scaled down model of the entire hill complex, which we saw uh, previously. And all the hills have been uh, you know, <clears throat> in a sunken area in the center of the museum. We have created this model and then various features associated, archeological features, uh, associated with this landscape are also shown um, in this particular one. And then we have two floored <coughs> museum where in the ground floor we have the story of human evolution, biocultural evolution from the earliest times. And then the first floor is dedicated to the Neolithic and Iron Age. It's not only Sanganakallu that we had uh, investigated, larger number of sites, much smaller sites in the area were in the Royal Sima region were also investigated by us. All the antiquities have been brought here and they are on display on the first floor. And the, the museum is named after the pioneer, um, <coughs> that is Robert Brucefoot, and then uh, you know, generated this kind of infographics in order to make sure that the museum becomes a dynamic center of activity. 
catering to the needs of people of all walks of life, including school children, the teachers, school teachers, college going students, and also distinguished visitors and so on. Such infographics have been generated, which provide information about you know, various stages of human biocultural evolution, and then how the local archeological you know, <coughs> history can be projected to the local people, educate them through outreach activity, and make sure that the villagers also participate in this venture to protect, preserve, and also identify you know, the, the archeological features in the neighborhood of those villages and so on. So we are focusing on school children in the rural areas, and then we are also tying up with uh, Jim Premji um, <clears throat> teacher learning centers, um, and then we uh, conduct workshops, and then day-to-day -day basis, we have a large number of school children coming and uh, you know, looking at that. And then the rock art that we see on the hill has also been uh, you know, <clears throat> created in front of the, the museum here, and uh, the school children are given uh, an exercise you know, to participate, to compete with each other in uh, redrawing the images that we have been able to replicate on huge boulders. Uh, the, these are the imageries that we see at the site and the huge boulders uh, were transported to the premises and then uh, replication has been done. So students participate and they try to understand. We give them exercises and uh, they are very, very interested in learning. And that is also helping um, our museum activities a great deal. And then we are also inspired by their you know, support and uh, participation. And we do have distinguished visitors like the governor of Karnataka uh, visiting the museum uh, a few months ago. And then <clears throat> the former chairman of Hitzro was also here recently. And they were all very happy that, you know, setting up small museums in interior uh, regions, you know, will be much more beneficial and much more effective in communicating with the local people uh, and making them aware of uh, the heritage in the, in, the, in the area where they are living. And then so that they own this heritage for themselves. So that untoward, you know, mining activity, destruction of some such sites can be prevented. So we have been successful not only in the Bellary region, we similar experience we had when we were working in the Karnul region, where we have early Paleolithic sites associated with limestone caves and so on. Like Granadis mining takes place in this area, limestone mining takes place in Karnul area. So many of those well-known caves, you know, such as Billasargam cave and all, where we have evidence of human activity going back to 80,000, 90,000 years, are also being subject to some kind of destruction. We were able to educate people and then make sure that they don't destroy the archaeological context that is preserved in this area. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. So while we saw rock art of the bull, the humped bull, so what makes uh, you sure that, you know, they were defied, they were uh, defied. correct? Okay. The story begins from about 12,000 years ago. In Southwest Asia, we have domestic sanctuaries where bull and, uh, you know, mother, mother were worshipped together. So bull is male uh, fertility god uh, and uh, <coughs> the mother goddess, fertility god, is also there. So the mother and the bull, uh, they are commonly associated with fertility right from the earliest phase of the Neolithic and is very, very frequently seen across you know, from Southwest Asia to India. And even today, the bull temples are, you know, widespread in different parts of South Indians. So they have a history of more than 12,000 years. And as I said, we did that archaeofaunal analysis. Uh, animal bone uh, were classified and then they were subject to taphonomical study by specialists. Uh, they found that uh, other than cattle bones, you know, all other animal bones revealed evidence for, you know, uh, <coughs> burning, you know, cut marks to extract marrow and so on, whereas cattle bones were not. And then the humped bull is jebu, is typically Indian, uh, local domesticate. And then uh, this occurs right from uh, 12,000 years ago in Southwest Asian sites to till today in different parts of India. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, hi. So, I actually had uh, multiple questions. Yeah. So, okay, please. Um, the first one was um, so you had mentioned something called uh, the wheel made megalithic ware. Sorry? 
uh, wheel made megalithic work yeah, yeah. is that the same as um, black and red uh, yes you pottery? saw the black and red work yeah are they the same pottery? thing that is the wheel made one okay. which appears around 1200 1300 bc okay. prior to that we all neolithic early phase of neolithic pottery was all handmade there are three or four categories of ceramics uh, uh, buff ware coarse grey ware and then uh, purple ware and so on burnished ware so, and then sometimes slip is applied but mostly a 99% handmade so wheel gets introduced later in time when the large scale stone axe manufacturing art, art activity also uh, takes place okay so do you find evidence of handmade pottery also in places like sanganakalu 100% lot of it i mean i didn't go into all those aspects because the focus was on excavation and the museum yeah, yeah. um my second question was um where all the stone axes made in um at least the sangnakalu area um all polished yeah they were all polished yes yes okay. they they is the typical tool type of the neolithic is the polished stone axe okay. so they are called you know celts and they were produced deliberately that is why they are called neolithic stone axes new technology and these were food producing tools not food procuring tools so that is the basic distinction between paleoliths and then neoliths so hunter gatherer people they produce those hand axes cleavers and so on whereas the early agricultural communities they produce this new technology a new type of raw material because this is fine grained massive rock easy to grind and achieve smooth surfaces and also axe edge is much more efficient compared to if you use a coarse grained granite you can't generate an axe of the type mm-hmm. that i was showing you granite was def- uh, deliberately used for producing other kinds of artifacts food processing you know artifacts even the bedrock was utilized for polishing dolerite axes and the bedrock was also uh, u- utilized for processing grains there are corn crushers rubbing stones quern stones and so on so they are all in granite whereas these axes chisels and so on were deliberately made from dolerite rock okay. which is also known as gabbro Uh, okay sorry last question yeah, you have, yeah. <laughs> so um you were saying that there were some animal remains found in the where were they found inside the ash mound itself yes yes uh, that is one reason why robert bruce foot was able to identify not only animal remains but also other artifacts like portable querns you know typical neolithic pottery sherds you know you know uh, the ash mound i showed you is a cut section and then you know that cut section has been there for the last 100 years or so every time archaeologists went when they uh, they found these antiquities okay. um yeah no how come they were found inside ash mounds uh, that was my question mm-hmm. accumulation was taking place you okay. see they were accumulating um, they were creating a platform they were not just dumping ash i mean mm-hmm. cattle dung on the uh, rugged surf uneven mm-hmm. surface mm-hmm. they were leveling the surface sometimes they used to even create gravel platforms and then uh, accumulate cow dung not in one episode multiple episodes so these were seasonal camps i did not go into all those aspects so every time they came came back at a particular part of the year accumulation was taking place and then they were before they left the place it was set on fire certain rituals were performed mm-hmm. and so you know it is auto combustible material gobar gas and uh, once it is set on fire it rises to nearly 800 to 1200 mm-hmm. degree centigrade so that is why that vitrification took place it looks kankari you know material so that is why they thought it is volcanic in origin some scholars they you know thought that these are glass manufacturing glass in the sense bead yeah. you know this is artificial glass manufacturing sites but there is no evidence for any such activity and the some people thought it is mass cremation and uh, some it was wally sugriva's fight all such uh, you know grotesque theories were there but now we have tried to understand uh, articulate the formation of an ash mound to the cultural activity of that time period so it when agricultural way of life came into existence rituals fertility rituals became very very common place so that is where we see this okay okay thank you so much yes welcome <laughs> Hi sir, what uh, language was was language prevalent? Was written language prevalent? No And evidence. That is why we call it prehistoric. Even the Harappan civilization, we have not deciphered. 
the Harappan script, we don't know what they spoke and what they wrote. So we still call it proto-historic. And this is even early pre-literate societies and uh, no evidence of any written language. Even graffiti is not seen in the Neolithic context. But graffiti begins to appear from about you know, 12, 1300 BC onwards on megalithic pottery. The Egyptian civilization, huh. 2000 years back, they had a script, right? Yeah. So they were not Neolithic. No, they were already urbanized. They were all like our Harappans. We had trade links with the Egyptian, Mesopotamian, right. and so on. Yeah. So they didn't have. A, what about oral language? Also, we we don't know the. Yeah, yeah. Oral language have been there right from you know, very early times. Means of communication was there, was but there. a symbolic expression has not been there. You have vocal symbols, but not uh, uh, you know alphabetical symbols. Would it be fair to say that? Uh, Kannada or Telugu was being spoken, some variant of it. Uh, yeah, there is, a, there is an attempt to relate the Neolithic to the Dravidian languages. Some of the food crops uh, that we have here, they, they ex help us to extrapolate the right. early uh, evidence for Dravidian languages. We have four family uh, language families and then the names of the food crops also gives us, you know, clues to the way in which uh, you know, Neolithic populations, uh, communities were expanding. So language families were also moving into different parts of the interactions were there. Along with the new crops, new vocabulary also got introduced. So they were not simply coming by air. You see, wheat and barley, they were introduced into India because of interaction between the communities and so on. So we have Bastar, you know, coming, Thurdal coming from Bastar region. So there were these Munda languages people. So all that was taking place. There's no concrete evidence to say yes, this. The possibility is a Dravidian uh, substratum is not uh, ruled out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. I have two uh, questions yeah. related. Do the stone axes have any indication that wooden handles yeah. were attached to them? Yes. And the second question is, if so, whether the axis of the handle was parallel to the edge of the axe or perpendicular to it, because yeah. that determines how the axe was used and yeah. what for yeah. what purpose. They were both handheld as well as hafted, hafted to a you know, long yeah. stick and so on, tied okay. with… Uh, how, how, how is that determined? There are examples from other sites, if not from here. Oh, okay. So there these microliths, no yes, microliths were made and uh, they were hafted in a groove for harvesting, you know, like sickles and so on. They're the forerunners of modern day sickles. Okay. So these are composite tools. So yeah. blades were hafted in a groove and then vitamin was used. Resins were used to fix them in a groove and then used for harvesting purposes. But there, there are clear any, examples from is many. Is there any indication hmm. whether the axis of the handle was yeah. perpendicular to the edge or parallel? Parallel it. it was. Huh? Parallel. Because there are you have a different triangular, types of uses a, that one yeah, can yeah, use. Yeah, they were also handheld for manipulating. No, handheld is different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are examples where it, they were tied and the experiments were carried out by archaeologists. Yeah. So they are very, very efficient in cutting uh, So the, the things were basically edge was parallel to the handle. Yeah, like modern day axes. Yeah, but not but like adhesives. Not edges, no. not edges, no. access only. That's what I want. Edges, edges are for smoothing the surface exactly. of the wood. Exactly. Yeah. Sir, you, I think you very briefly sort of stated how you went about setting up the museum yeah. and preserving the site. Yeah. I think that's an interesting story by itself. I think you sort of uh, made it, you narrated it very briefly, but mm. I would imagine there must have been Several challenges. Yeah, indeed it was. Can uh, you discuss that briefly? Uh, yeah, actually, um, the first and foremost thing for us was uh, to s make sure that the quarrying, quarrying comes to an end. And that was, we were threatened also when we made attempt to, to approach authorities. And then because many powerful people were involved in mining activity. And it's such a large scale mining activity. And Bellari was both famous and infamous for this kind of mining business taking place. Not only granite was being mined, the iron ore and you know the, the region, we have greenstone belts there. They were rich in other uh, resources, raw material resources for these people. So that, that was one thing. 
and then um, convincing the authorities uh, that this mining has to be stopped and authorities themselves had a series of problems they said it is the question of livelihood of people who are engaged in mining activity their labor and so on the migrant families who are engaged in mining granite small scale large scale and so on so that was also very difficult for us but then once we were able to convince the ias officers they made a way, you know <coughs> tried to find ways because if we approached the archaeological survey of india they said no it is not a protected site we cannot protect uh, you know each and every site across the country we approached the state department of archaeology this is not a notified site we can't interfere and so on so that is where i said we have to adopt the site for the simple reason that nobody else is going to take care and we have to do something so the best best thing that we could do was approach the local authorities and then bother them repeatedly it was not easy to convince the is because they had their own administrative technical problems coming in the way of uh, stopping mining activity and politicians interfere and when politicians interfere even people like us were also threatened we did not bother i said this is one site which is the largest site that we have and it has preserved the history of the settlements covering a time span of nearly 2000 years and if such sites are lost you know no, no other site can be protected or preserved the smaller sites will simply go away the highways are consuming archaeological landscapes and so on and then um, after repeated uh, uh, <coughs> approach to the deputy commissioners then uh, there was one of them he said you come and educate us about the site so i had a three hour sitting with them a similar talk i gave them senior officers were sitting in this at the end of the thing he said okay you come with us and whatever we can do we will help you to do so he brought us to the complex where we have these buildings and they said if you want you take one of these buildings and you know, do if you want to preserve your antiquities from sanganakal i said i don't have not only sanganakalu material i have some material from several other sites in the area so <clears throat> that was an underutilized building and the deputy commissioner was one arvind srivastha who is now uh, the center so he said yes you take this building i'll give you 8 lakhs so the first thing we did was set up this scale down model and then create these cabinets uh, you know transfer the antiquities from huge uh, you know gunny bags trunks and so on into boxes they provided money for that so everything came once they were convinced that we mean what we are you know talking so they started initially 8 lakh came then another 2 lakhs came and each deputy commissioner we approached they said we are running short of boxes to transfer the material so they managed to get um and then when uh, mr nakul was deputy commissioner of bellari he was uh, he was worried you see that he is not progressing the way it should have been done so he he asked me to come and meet him and then i told him this is what i require then he said you don't worry i will manage resources for you so up to about 50 lakhs he managed very quickly i said in order to catalog uh, the antiquities first and foremost is cataloging is essential and then we will have the information uh, <coughs> about our past through infographics so for all that i gave him a proposal up to about 50 lakhs or so then uh, prior to mr nakul there was one ram prasad uh, he he made the jindal people uh, to support our cause so initially about 20 lakhs came and when nakul came he gave us uh, three assistants to catalog who were trained in visual you know museum uh, you know cataloging and so on and so forth so for one and a half year uh, very quietly we were working on cataloging and so on and then uh, storing them in in a systematic way and then we now know what material we have from large number of sites not only from sanganakalu from series of sites and so on and then additional resources were made available uh, then the infographics were uh, you know generated and then meanwhile we were look worried about the highway expansion between hospet and bellary uh, it was going to destroy that the one and only ashmont which has survived till today so the bulldozers were <laughs> brought to the site so since we were in touch with the senior officers one of the sps uh, one chetan who is now in mysore so he was passing he, he was like our student only so fortunately because of my age all these officers used to treat me with some respect <laughs> because i was doing this work so i said uh, he called me immediately you know i am passing by this mound and some bulldozer is stopped you know is right near the mound 
then i said sir please stop it first so next thing you know he, next village he reached torangal and sent his sub inspector he seized the <laughs> gammon india companies bulldozer and so on and then uh, ram prasad was still deputy commissioner so we told him the story of uh, the discovery and how different theories have been put across and what we think of it and why it should be preserved and it is in the center of the highway and it will be a landmark and uh, <clears throat> can be preserved forever and your predecessors have built a small wall and let us rebuild the wall and then develop into a tourist destination both for people who passers by and then our core researchers so other ashmounts have all been leveled so that also then uh, btps delari thermal power station people they came forward up to about 1.5 crores they have given now that wall has been rebuilt we have re- developed the, you could not go there and uh, electrification is taking place and we have huge bulls uh, cement bulls being made and they will be installed right in front of the ashmont on, a, on a, either end of this thing so that is going to be a permanent uh, permanently protected ashmont anywhere in south india and so on so this is the kind of excitement that we have uh, you know enjoyed working for the preservation of cultural heritage and so on i must say i mean thanks to these ias officers who have really you know they understand what we speak you know that is the point here uh, you know if you go to an archaeological survey officer or a state archaeology department they will not bother so that is why we are not handed over the museum to the government as yet <laughs> so this is yeah sorry yeah yeah it has been preserved for the last 5000 years <clears throat> in the future also nothing will happen because the government has uh, we gave an action plan to the government when mr edyurupa was chief minister he year marked 5 crores for that uh, for the development of this site and then 2 uh, crores have been re- released and the money is not released to any of us it is released to uh, government uh, tourism department we, I, i mean they are executing our action plan the site is being developed so that is that is one assurance that we have and the, the rock art will not be damaged further yeah <coughs> oh yes thank you for the story sir uh, just a question about the sites itself so uh, given these uh, workshops and the factory sites that are there i uh, was curious about the the sphere of influence that uh, these sites have like or uh, how far did the trading go or the those those tools that they produced they must have yes seeds church sir no that particular site was associated uh, with the dolerite dike which mm. cuts through the hill mm. and that is the ideal dolerite or gabbro uh, there are several dikes cutting across the granitic hills but not all dike uh, spots were selected for making ground stone axes only this particular uh, you know and then the landscape itself was very ideal uh, for locating a, a factory there so series of workshops could be uh, set up on the plateau of the you know large hill and uh, as i said uh, the network <coughs> was widespread uh, maybe of the order of uh, you know, 50 to 100 km radius radius i mean so all across and then there are some exotic raw materials like chert which is otherwise called flint was also brought from long distance so chert came from kallur karnool limestone belt chert came from limestone belt in northern karnataka in the bima basin and so on so there is such long distance trade was i mean is also reflected in the food crops that were yeah. introduced from such long distances so it's a widespread network that is where you know long distance trade gradually gave rise to process of urbanization of southern india mm. whereas uh, indus valley civilization was gradually declining mm. this part of the indian subcontinent gradually you know progressing towards the second urbanization that is what we call oh. yeah thank you yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that uh, so the sites how how close of uh, how, what are the proximity of the sites themselves Uh, were they handled by like like i think you mentioned of you know like a family or maybe uh, you know specialized uh, you know people who have that occupation must be doing it did they move between the different sites or was each of them associated with different family units and all yeah there were um, you know we don't have much information yeah. Yeah. Uh, but as we understand the location of sites they were interrelated mm. 
so if if you stand at uh, sanganakallu in a hill top and look around in any direction every 2 to 3 kilometers you have a neolithic site mm. and most of the smaller sites are uh, located in proximity to the you know occurrence of resources you know like raw material resources so if if you go along the greenstone belt foothills you have smaller uh, neolithic sites for example that ash pond is in the heart of uh, the greenstone belt so that kind of relationship small and large settlements so every 2 or 3 kilometers uh, you have a neolithic site wherever you have granitic inselberg mm. so smaller and larger this is the largest one that we see the next largest that i can um, you know imagine in this area is a site village called kurugodu yeah. uh, about 20 kilometers from sanganakallu in the western part of uh, western direction so there are these sites uh, which are i mean sites are known but not have been subject to study understood yeah thank, thank you um, if i understood you correctly you were talking about the the hill being a very unusual position for a settlement whereas like it would be more natural to live by a river side or something like that but i was just wondering especially when i was listening to the last question could it be that actually the whole plain around it was settled and it, that kind of huts that don't leave much archaeological traces and the hill could have been like a defensive settlement because you were talking about the axe grinding things so that sounds a bit like an arsenal or a, you know like a, a yeah. place that where the people who would defend the area would maybe be on the hill but there could be like a large maybe not urban but um, like a pre urban settlement around the hill where agriculture and animal husbandry took place its populations were very very small hmm. as you go back in time 5000 years ago populations were very very small and what we have done is uh, systematic field walking what we do so these are all identified as neolithic hill top settlements and then uh, from each of these settlement we radiated several kilometers to see for look for the remains of uh, human activity of that time period so beyond a kilometer from the base of the hill in any direction you gradually you know uh, experience decrease in the antiquities so there is no evidence for any settlement away from the hills in that area we have done that systematic field walking in, that, in order to ascertain that only hill tops were the places where the earliest villages were located Thank you.